Town Hall with Dean Ann Bayless and special guests, uh, Professor Mark Simpson and Mr. Alex Gerken. Uh, today's event is sponsored by the John and Lillian Neff College of Business and Innovation and the John and Lillian Neff Alumni Affiliate of the uh, Toledo Alumni Association. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jordan Valdivias, and I'm the president of the John and Lillian Neff College of Business Alumni Affiliate Board, which is tasked with working to engage and connect with the John and Lillian Neff College of Business Alumni of the University of Toledo all over the world. Um, as guests are joining us, I would like to sh just share a few housekeeping notes about our virtual event. So, um, attendees' names are not visible to others. Um, they're only visible to the host and presenter. Therefore, you will only see your name in the attendees list. Um, but I think today we have uh, a couple, uh, nearly 100 people signed up. So uh, you can be rest assured there's plenty of alumni here watching with you. Um, additionally, if you would like to change the view on your screen, you can just click in the upper right hand corner of your screen to expand or reduce the view. Um, so this event is being recorded and will be available on demand on ToledoAlumni.org. And that's just how it's spelled, ToledoAlumni.org. And you can find this video and plenty of other awesome videos um, related to uh, the colleges. So uh, to preserve bandwidth and allow the ultimate viewing experience, all attendees' mics are muted and cameras are turned off, um, except for um, the panelists. So we're going to jump into it here. Um, I'd like to officially welcome our first speaker and main moderator of this town hall meeting, uh, Dean of the College of Business and Innovation, Dr. Ann Bayless. Take it away, Dean Bayless. Thanks. And don't forget to who have joined us. There we go. All set. Everybody can hear me, I hope. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is uh, the third in a series of town halls, actually, that we've had this year. We intend to continue them. They've been quite successful, and they've allowed us to feature um, prominent guests, including faculty and their research, um, as well as an update, and, and in this case, um, a special alumnus. So uh, welcome again. Thank you. and. Feel free to share this and the link um, after the event with, with people who are unable to attend. Um, we would like to let you know that we are, we received some questions from you in advance for those who had registered and, and prompted us with some questions. And we've tried to incorporate those into the presentation. Um, if we do not get to your question, um, you'll get a personal response from me. Uh, so fear not. So on to our update. Here's our big news and something that you might have thought um, was a little unusual this time was our new name. So we have um, a slide deck that we prepared with updates. We are now officially the John B. and Lillian E. Neff College of Business and Innovation. I know it's a mouthful, but it's worth every minute. Um, we are so excited and grateful for this gift from the Neff family. It is a continuation of a gift that has been in force for a number of years and was just um, completed this past month. Um, so, so far, the resources that the Neff family have provided us include the naming of our finance department, um, the Neff Endowed Chair of Finance, Dr. Mark Simpson, who will be joining us, is that endowed chair, uh, Neff Fellowships for the faculty, uh, for faculty research, there is a NEF trading room in our College of Business and Innovation. There is a program that is sponsored uh, for uh, incoming freshmen. It's called the Jumpstart program uh, that the NEFs have funded as well. Uh, and this, uh, the completion of the gift includes resources for a NEF scholars program. Uh, those are uh, significant scholarships for a cohort of students each year, um, as well as endowed professorships in the college, so they would be NEF professors, um, as well as funds for an, um, 
innovation, innovative ideas, innovative projects, uh, new ideas to help us meet our mission of being a college of business and innovation. So we are so grateful. We plan to um, continue with the, the rebranding of our college. You see the, the insignia up above. Um, you'll see that all year long in different shapes and sizes. And uh, we're hoping for uh, an actual ribbon cutting event and new signage um, at our homecoming celebration in October. So stay tuned for that. You'll be hearing about it all year. And then hopefully we will have the Neff family and many others in attendance at the homecoming event. Um, many of you had asked about uh, how we had uh, fared over the course of the fall semester, how we had prepared uh, our buildings and our, our campus for uh, a safe return. And we actually have been commended for the way the campus has uh, addressed the coronavirus. There's been active testing, um, random testing, as well as uh, free testing for faculty, staff, and students. Um, any of the students who moved into the residence halls uh, a week and a half ago were tested prior to actually moving in. So that was well over a thousand students. Um, there's free testing going on on a regular basis. And you can see we have a dashboard. The, the link is there um, where we provide um, statistics every week. And we are absolutely um, at a positivity rate that is much lower than the Lucas County uh, rate. So we've been commended by the state in the way that we've handled it and we've been able to have a successful fall semester. We've moved as cautiously into the spring semester with um, at least 50% of the classes being uh, handled remotely or online. And um, there are classrooms for those uh, classes that are handled face to face. Uh, the students, of course, are required to be socially distant. Uh, they're cleaned at, at each at each turnover in uh, the class. Uh, there's plexiglass hanging. There's a lot of activity um, to keep all of our spaces clean and safe. And um, it's been quite successful again. So um, there was a question in uh, from a, a registrant about how it affected our enrollment. And in the fall, we anticipated a decline of 10%, uh, which in fact was realized, um, but fortunately not greater than 10%. And that was due to many considerations, obviously the pandemic. Um, there's also a demographic shift. There's a decline in the number of 18 year olds. Um, there were financial concerns by many of our students and their parents. Um, there was illness, obviously, in, and then there were students, younger students who had to stay at home to learn at home, and that inhibited some people from returning. So, um, so actually, it was not as devastating a decline as, as one could have expected, and as we know, many other colleges and institutions experienced. And then our fall to spring enrollment um, well, that's always declining. There's, you always expect a little bit of a decline for a number of reasons. One, because students, some students graduate in December, and also not many students take on um, their college classes or start a college year in January. Uh, also, uh, for again, for financial or academic reasons, you lose some students over the break. So um, we were down another 10%. Um, and so we retained 90%. Let's look at it in a positive way. And that's that's usually the case. So it was no different than in years past. So we have fared pretty well. And uh, enrollment is like the number one issue, the number one concern in, in addition to safety on our campus these days. Here's some good news that we just got very recently that we've been named a best on campus MBA as opposed to say an online MBA, although we do offer an online MBA for those of you who are interested and far away. Um, but we were very proud of this and we will make sure that we prominently display this Princeton Review ranking um, in all our social media and on our website. So proud of that accolade. 
We managed to um, sign a transfer agreement, what they call an articulation agreement with Monroe County Community College over the border in Michigan um, to make uh, more direct the pathway from their associate's degree program to our bachelor's of business administration. Uh, there's a special interest in supply chain management from those students. Um, there's actually a lot of, uh, supply chain activity going on, not just related to the pandemic, but the corridor from um, from Detroit to Toledo. And so the Monroe community is very interested in partnering with us on projects related to that. So more about that in the future, but we continue to look for opportunities to join and, and create these two plus two programs, they call them, and other versions of these programs so that students who are um, in currently in community colleges can have um, a seamless path to a bachelor's degree. We had our first virtual job fair in the fall. It was enormously successful. Students were able to get um, full time jobs and internships. We do this twice a year and so we're having a second one um, at the end of February and we're currently recruiting businesses who would like to partner with us. We have um, over 50 signed up thus far, but we typically have over 100 and we have six to 800 students <laughs> that often participate in this job fair. They're looking now for summer jobs, for full time jobs and for internships. And we were able, um, frankly, to retain these relationships through the pandemic. Many of our uh, business partners um, offered students remote opportunities. They did not rescind their offers. Um, and so our students were able to take advantage of the offers that had been made even pre pandemic. So we were grateful for that and we have a terrific placement rate in the college and we continue to work well with our business community partners. So thank you so much for participating. Here are some social media outlets to, to link with us, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Um, if, you, if you aren't uh, connected to any of these, I, I um, encourage you to, uh, mainly because we do post a lot of news about, you know, up-to-date daily news about uh, the accomplishments of our students, our programs, our faculty, and we're very proud of that. And there's a lot of chatter back and forth. Um, so feel free to, to link in with us in, in any way that you would like. I think Jordan doesn't need to make the introduction. I can certainly tell you that my first guest um, is a faculty member in the finance department, Dr. Mark Simpson, who is professor and John B. Neff Endowed Chair of Finance. Uh, his research includes exchange rates, foreign investment, and dividends, which is what he's going to be talking to us about today. So welcome, Dr. Simpson. Well, thank you. I mean, yes, I am unmuted. Okay. Um, so the, the paper that I'm going to present today is uh, poses an interesting question. It says, uh, you know, what difference do dividends make? And uh, this is from the investment or the portfolio portfolio management perspective. Um, this this paper was published in the Financial Analyst Journal in 2016. Um, it's co-authored by myself and Mitch Conover from University of Richmond and Gerald Jensen, who recently retired from Creighton University. I guess the dividends made a big difference for him. Anyway, the um, you may be asking why I uh, am presenting this particular paper, so I'll talk about its influence a little bit. Uh, it, as I said, it was published in the Financial Analyst Journal. Uh, it's a leading practitioner journal in the investment management community. And shortly after it was published, there was a um, write up in Barron's magazine to describe the article as brilliant. Um, now, you may, some of you may have heard that if a national publication describes something you've done as brilliant, that you will, over the next week, win every argument with your spouse. I 
have to tell you that's an urban legend. It does not come true. Um, but we're talking about dividends and we're talking about dividends within a particular context. And some of you may be familiar with different styles of investing. If you look at any mutual fund prospectus, you'll you'll see this this what is called the style box and, and the equity style box. And what it does is it takes two dimensions or two characteristics of stocks and it divides all the stocks up based on these two characteristics. So the first characteristic uh, going along the uh, vertical axis here is market capitalization. Market capitalization is just the total value of all the stock outstanding on the firm. So it's the total market value of equity. We use that as, we, we call that size in finance. In accounting, they, they usually measure firm size by assets, the value of the assets on the balance sheet something of that nature. I mean, you could also think about thinking about the number of employees that a firm has when you think of size. But in finance, we use the market value of the equity as size. So you divide up the firms by small, medium, and large. And then along the horizontal axis, we look at value, the value of the firm. Now, to, to determine whether a firm is value or growth or something in the middle, you have to use some sort of price ratio and practitioners usually use the the price to earnings ratio the the price to earnings ratio the pe ratio as you may have heard it called um it just tells you for every one dollar of profit that is earnings right every one dollar of profit how much you're paying for the stock today so you could think about if you had two two firms that were very similar and one had a PE ratio of 10, and one had a PE ratio of eight. If you bought the one with the higher PE ratio, you'd be paying more, $2 more, for every dollar in earnings. So this is a way of kind of saying that the cheaper one would be a value, it would be a value stock. And that's how the term is used. So firms with low PE ratios are called value stocks. Firms with high PE ratios are called growth stocks. And, and so you, there are different you know, hypotheses, different styles of investing. Some people think you should invest in growth stocks. Some people think you should invest in value stocks. And this box just kind of tells you uh, for a given portfolio, what kind of style is it pursuing? And of course, there are some very famous value investors, John Neff being one. John Neff was a value investor and, and, and Warren Buffett you know, would be another famous value investor. But just to show you how this box works, if you, I know many of you probably already have seen these, but it, here's the S&P 500, which is a portfolio. And the, and the way you get into the S&P 500 as a firm is you have to be one of the largest 500 firms in the market, large by capital uh, market capitalization. So obviously the S&P 500 is going to plot in the large area. And then it doesn't specifically look at the value of the stocks that are that are included. It's just based on size. So it has a blend of value and growth stocks. And so this is where the S&P 500 would plot. So what we do is we, we take this uh, these two dimensions and we add a third dimension. So we look at um, all publicly traded stocks from July 1963 to December 2014, that's 51 and a half years. And it's all publicly traded stocks on the major exchanges. Uh, we don't look at pink sheets and things of that nature, um, mainly because we don't have data on it. Uh, that's an interesting phenomenon. Anyway, uh, we sort it by size and book value. Um, we use book value instead of PE ratio. It's just, um, there are some minor differences, but we it's the idea is the same. We take the market value to the book value and we determine what's a value stock based on that or what's a growth stock. Academicians tend to, to use book value. Practitioners tend to use PE ratios. And that's probably a good paper, which is better, uh, but I haven't written that yet. Um, you further, further within each of those boxes, so we divide all the stocks up into those nine boxes, and then within each of those boxes, we make portfolios and we divide the firms up based on their dividend yields. And so we would have a portfolio in each one of those boxes of zero dividends, firms that don't pay dividends. And then we would have what we call the low dividend payments. It's the bottom 50% of, of dividend yields. And then we have the high dividend payers, which are the top dividend yields from the 50% mark, the median, up to the 95th percentile. 
And then we have the extreme dividends, which are the, the highest 5% of dividend yields. And this is actually what the Barron's article said it was brilliant. I, I'm not sure that it's brilliant, but it makes sense. The reason why we, we separate these extreme dividend yields out is because if you think about dividend yield as a measure, dividend yield is usually calculated as the amount of the dividends that have been paid over the last 12 months divided by the current price. Well, you could have a stock that paid dividends over the last 12 months, and then something catastrophic happened to it this last week, and its current price has plummeted. That stock would have a huge dividend yield. That doesn't mean it's a good investment, right? So we're talking about dividend, extreme dividend yields can sometimes be 70%, 25%. 20%. The high dividend yields, I, the median is around 4%. Okay. So we, we wanted to separate out those very high extreme dividend yields because we believe that they're going to behave differently than, say, these, these high or low dividend yields or no dividend yields. So there's obviously a lot of things we look at in the paper, but here I've kind of summarized the main results, and there's a lot going on in this table, so I'll, I'll explain it to you. Here I have the, the size breakdown, large, uh, mid, and small cap. And then I've just taken the value column and the growth column. So if we go back, I've excluded the blend. I could include it, but it's just basically in between the, the other two, so it doesn't really add that much to the, to the discussion. And so what I have here are monthly returns over that 51 and a half year period for those portfolios. So I have the monthly returns, the risk, which is the standard deviations of the returns, and then I've annualized the difference between the two portfolios. And the two portfolios that I presented, and on the left, you have the no dividend uh, paying stocks and the high dividend paying stocks. That's, I presented that because we, that's where you get the biggest difference. Now, if you look at large value stocks, you see actually the no dividend paying stocks uh, look like they outperformed the, the, the high dividend paying stocks. And these are generally large value stocks are, are um, stable and you wanna think Dow Jones industrial average, um, things of that nature. This is not statistically different. So this could just be purely by chance. That's what that means. So there's really no difference in the returns in this box. But if you look at the risk, you can see that the risk is significantly and substantially lower for the dividend paying stocks versus the non-dividend paying stocks. In every other box, you can see that the, the dividend paying stocks clearly outperform the non-dividend paying stocks. And what's interesting is when you get over here and you look at growth stocks, um, that difference you know, accumulates to an 8.21% per year difference in returns, which is huge, at a significantly lower uh, risk level. There is a, a, a more modest difference uh, with the value stocks. And I, I should say with the value stocks and particularly with the large ones, um, we break this out in the paper and we also look at the, the, the performance, the ex post dividend yield, you know, how much of the return was attributed to, to dividends uh, after we've done this sorting, we do the sorting a priori, and then we look at returns. And in the large value stocks, even the non-dividend paying stocks had a significant dividend yield. What that means is that after the point in time where we looked, those the firms, we said they're, no, they're not dividend payers because they hadn't paid dividends over the last 12 months, but many of them started paying dividends in the following uh, analysis. Um, and that's not necessarily true for a lot of the other stocks. So what's the takeaway? Uh, while obviously portfolios tilted toward dividend paying stocks have the same or higher returns, but lower risk. And also higher dividend yield appears, appears to be better, except for the extreme ones. Uh, so what I mean by that is the high dividend payers were better than the low dividend payers, which were better than the no dividend payers. And then that extreme dividend yield, so as I talked about, that's probably driven by declining prices and they were all over the place. And, um, Probably not. I'm not. I'm not giving any advice, but you know, it, you know, you could do what you want, but uh, I, I would probably avoid those. Um, you see a stock with a 70% dividend yield; it's probably not a good investment. I can say that. Um, so the interesting thing here is that in our paper, we we're documenting that the lower risk portfolios have the higher returns. And this is actually, you know, contrary to financial theory. In financial theory, we think of returns as being compensation for taking on risk. 
But what we're documenting is that if you take on the, the risk, you don't get compensated. And actually, there's been a stream of literature that's been showing this recently in the in the most prominent uh, art, um, journals. It, here's an article in the Review of Accounting Studies from 2019, uh, quality minus junk. And these authors used a number of quality measures, not just whether they paid dividends or not, but like um, profit, high profit margins, uh, liquidity, things of that nature. And they found that the, the portfolios of the quality firms had higher returns than the portfolios of the poor quality or junk uh, stocks. And then some of the two of the same authors from that study in the Journal of Financial Economics in 2014 had a study where, where they looked at the beta, which is a, an alternative risk measure from the capital asset pricing model. And they found that low beta or low risk stocks outperformed high beta or high risk stocks in that paper. Um, I think they do some, some sorting before they look at the betas, but nonetheless, they show that low beta was associated with higher risk. And then currently I'm working on a paper, uh, I've actually written the paper, it's out under review. It's the size dependent firm age effect. It's co-authored between myself and Axel Grossman, who holds the um, Friedman Endowed Chair in Free Enterprise at Georgia Southern University, and also many years ago was my PhD student. Um, and the and I'm very proud of him for he was just recently named the Endowed Chair down there. But anyway, the um, the paper looks at age. Uh, and, and the age of firms, because if you think about particularly small firms, if you think about a small firm that's been a small firm for 20 years and hasn't grown, become a large firm, there's probably an economic reason for that. Um, that may be all that the market is demanding of that, that type of product that they're producing. So there's no reason for them to grow. And they also may be very stable. They have, a, they have established relationships with creditors. And actually what we find is that the, the old small firms uh, had borrow more at lower cost and actually produce higher returns than young small firms, which again is contrary to uh, financial theory. Um, so I guess we'll open it up now for any questions that people have. Let's see if I can get out of this. And I just wanted to remind everybody that's watching that you can uh, add any questions to the chat uh, in the bottom right hand corner of this and, um, Dean Bales is going to go ahead with some questions that have been pre submitted. And, uh, Dean Bales, did you have some, uh, questions pre submitted or should we, um, uh, grab some from the audience? What, what do you think here? Um, no, I did not, but I, I do have a, a question of my own so I could get it started off that way. Um, where, where do you see this going? If it is contrary, is it, a, is it a turning point in theoretically, or is it, uh, an, an anomaly that, uh, that is brilliant? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah. it's, um, yeah, it's. That's an interesting point, and it's actually difficult to say because if it's an anomaly, and it could, and it's not doesn't necessarily have to be an anomaly. It could just be a normal statistics. For example, um, and we just have too small a sample, and you say, well, you had fifty one and a half years. Well, if there's some event that's going to occur that where you're going to have very large returns for those risky stocks in one year, and it just happens every hundred years. Then 51 and a half years isn't long enough to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like predicting tsunamis, right? If you're predicting how how far the tide is going in, and you know there's a tsunami a tsunami every hundred years, you're going to incorporate a small probability of a very large event, and you're going to be wrong for 99 years. It's going to look like you're biased and overestimating the tide until. Yeah that tsunami actually happens. So it's it's difficult to know whether it's actually a change or it's just a st uh, statistical artifact. Thank you. And we do have a question here from the chat. Um, if uh, if we can, just so you know that we have one in the, in the hopper here. If you have another question, we can do that first maybe, or we can switch to the chat question. Let me know. I'll just go ahead and uh, ask the uh, chat question here. 
Um, so obviously the stock market has been in, is always in the news, but there's some things specific in the news. Um, one of the questions from the audience is thoughts on, uh, what are your thoughts on the GameStop, you know, GME short squeeze, Robinhood market interference with restricting option trading and 2020, 2021 outlook given the 15% increase in currency circulation from March, 2020 to December, 2020 and questionable positive real economic data. I know that was a mouthful, but. Um, yeah, I think there's, I think there's several questions there. Um, that I'll, tr I'll try to answer the ones that I could answer. Um, the, the one about, so I guess, what are your thoughts about GameStop? Um, Obviously, it's not necessarily something that I research on a daily basis, but um, I'm obviously aware of what's going on. It depends on on how you you pose the question. I mean, for those of you that don't know what's going on with GameStop, um, there is a Reddit um, that talks about investing in stocks, and several of the members of that of that Reddit have been talking up GameStop, uh, oh, I, I think for a year or more. But recently, uh, there's been a number of small investors that have been buying GameStop. Um, and that's interesting because GameStop uh, had a very high short interest. And what a short interest is, is the percentage of the shares that are, that are outstanding that have been shorted by somebody. When you short a stock, you borrow the stock and you sell it immediately. It's as if I, it's, if I think that Toyota Corollas are going to go down in price and I come to you and I say, hey, can I borrow your car? And, and you say, what are you going to do with it? Oh, I'm going to sell it. <laughs> okay. And that's exactly what's going on with short selling. I sell it and I say, oh, don't worry. Uh, uh, when you want your car back, I'll buy it. I'll buy another Corolla and give you that Corolla. And that's exactly what happens with stocks. So with, when they short them, they borrow the stock, they short it, but then because they borrowed the stock, right, they're, they, they have to keep a margin account with, the, with their broker. So when the stock price starts rising, they have a choice. They can either put more money into their account or they can close their position. If you, to close a short position, you have to buy the stock, right? In order to get out of the, the deal with the Corolla, I have to go buy a new Corolla. So what happened here is that the small investors started buying game stock, which a number of hedge funds had shorted very heavily. But when they started buying, they drove the, the stock price up. When the stock price is driven up, these, these hedge funds start losing money and they have to start closing their positions, which means they have to buy the stock, which further drives the price up. And that's what a short squeeze is. And it's been phenomenal. I mean, GameStop has gone from twenty dollars. It was. It's been three hundred dollars recently, and it's and it's fluctuated by a hundred dollars in uh, up and down in recent days. And there are a lot of people that are upset that saying that you know this is stock manipul manipulation. I mean, I can't really speculate about that or whether the SEC is going to intervene. I think that the SEC would have to. Uh, from my understanding, which I'm not a lawyer, uh, but my understanding is that they would have to prove that the people on Reddit intentionally misled people about the fundamentals, right? There's a difference between me saying, hey, let's all go buy GameStop and me saying, hey, GameStop is going to be fantastic and it's going to outperform in the future when I know that it's not. And that's be very difficult anyway to prove in a court. I mean, if you, if you look at a lot of SEC cases, the the they often fail in their cases just because what they're trying to prove is so difficult to prove. So that's um, outlook for 2021. I don't have an outlook for 2021. Um, let, let's get rid of COVID. Um, that's about it. That's a good plan, I think, across the board for sure. Mm -hmm. Is see. there another question or, or is time up? I think we are just about out of time for now. Uh, but thank you for those incredible insights and going over your research. Very, very interesting. So we're going to go over and switch gears here to uh, Alex Gerken and Anne, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mark, for your insights. I'm so incredibly proud of the NEF faculty research um, and, and 
I intend to share more of them in the future. You remember last town hall, we had Dr. Dana Holly. Now we've had Dr. Mark Simpson, and we will have yet another individual in the future and, and continue our series. It, it's, um, it, shares, it shares their research and their knowledge and their expertise. And so thank you again, Mark, very much. And now I would like to introduce an alumnus who may need no introduction. I know uh, some of you are, are calling in from far away, but um, Alex Gerken uh, was recently appointed Toledo City's president of Fifth Third Bank, and he has been a very active alumnus with our college and the university. Um, he has uh, served on the advisory board for the Center for Family Business, uh, Fifth Third Bank and Alex are also actively engaged with our business career programs office and in uh, supporting students in their uh, professionalized uh, professionalization uh, and all the activities that go along with that, all the uh, the mock interviews and the uh, resume building and so on. Um, also, uh, as a former sales student as well, um, he is remains engaged with the Schmidt School for Professional Sales, and we are grateful for that too. Um, he did get his bachelor's degree in finance magna cum laude from our, our college, and we're proud of that, and an MBA from the Ohio State University. Um, his other activities in the community include um, serving on the Toledo um, Regional Chamber of Commerce, uh, and I sit with, on that board as well, so I get to see him on a regular basis. The Prometica Community Board, the United Way of Northwestern Ohio, again on our Center for Family Business Advisory Board, and First T of Great Lakes. Um, he's board president of the Marathon Classic and vice president of the Epilepsy Center Foundation Board. And um, again, I'd like to thank Alex for joining us. And we do have some questions to get this conversation started because people did have, we're very curious about um, the banking industry and the effect of the pandemic on it. And we have some questions too that are student related. So I'll kick it off with uh, one question that says, I'm sure becoming city president of Fifth Third in the midst of a pandemic has been no easy task. What leadership values or management principles have helped you to navigate this tumultuous time? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dean. Can you hear me okay? I just wanna confirm that. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks, first of all, for the introduction and for allowing me to, to join here today. Obviously proud of my UT heritage and, and I'm always happy to give back uh, to the university and, and thank you to all the uh, participants who are here today. I'm glad to see that leveraging the virtual technology brings folks from across the country. So that first question is a good one. I mean, frankly, we could spend the next 20 minutes talking about it because um, you know, it's you always dream of the day when somebody flips you the keys and says you're in charge. And uh, I don't think the dream ever included anything that looked anything like uh, the things that we've dealt with. But from a leadership values and management principles perspective, um, you know, I tried to, uh, as we began to navigate the pandemic, really tried, tried to break it down to the basics because I think it's always important when you're backed up against the wall to think through the basics. And for me, you know, those basics include a couple of different things. Banking is a people business. So communication and communicating to my team and frankly to the market, to our clients, our centers of influence became extremely important uh, on, with the onset of the pandemic and, and then specifically through the transition to president. Uh, so I would say communication is number one, and we can, again, talk for hours on how we did that. But to me, that was the most important thing. The, the second thing is really tough for a lot of people, but I think from a leadership value perspective, it's change leadership and being able to lead both, again, organization, a community um, through whatever it might be. And in this case, it was the leadership transition, but also um, you know, the pandemic and guiding the bank's employees through the pandemic. So I've been with the bank for 20 years. Um, that wasn't mentioned in my bio. So for me, I, the one thing I always say is that the one thing that's constant inside the bank and in the industry is change. So change is constant. 
And as a leader, you need to be prepared to lead your organization. And then the, the other thing I would mention here is uh, flex, flexibility is extremely important. Um, and it, during this pandemic, what became and just the nature of it and how quickly we shifted from on-site working to working remotely. And again, I could talk all day about that, but <laughs> understand the, import, the importance of um, uh, factors that impact your employee that don't happen in the office. So if you think about that, on March, I think the date was like the 10th or 11th, we as a bank averaged 2,500 employees working remotely across our entire footprint. By March 16th, that number grew to 12,500. So almost half of the bank's overall staffing worked remotely over literally a long weekend. And so there were a lot of things that happened. We took our employees from an environment where they're, the bulk of them, from where they're in the office every day, so now working from, like a lot of you experience from home, uh, I joke that I put my dogs in there so they wouldn't bark. But all the things that, that influence your employees outside of what you see every day in the office environment, and those things were magnified dramatically. So for me, it was try, trying to be a person first and a leader and a boss second, and just working with our, our staff to be flexible and, you know, picking up kids or frankly, homeschooling, um, working with parents and all the things that I'm sure each one of you um, had to deal with during this pandemic. But but then I guess be as a leader, really being cognizant of that and understanding and flexible and really knowing that if you provide that, that flexibility for your employees, you'll probably get more out of them than you even bargained. So those were some of the things that I tried to focus on, you know, during the transition. And if, if I had to do it all over again, I certainly you know, wouldn't want to say goodbye to Bob LeClaire and his, you know, his, uh, the impact that he had not only on the bank, but also in the community. I would want to have a huge, massive celebration in town, but, you know, unfortunately that just wasn't possible. We wished him well, and he's smiling today down in Naples, Florida, um, while we're dealing with the cold uh, here in Toledo, but we would have certainly done things differently, but at the end of the day, you can't change it. So you just learn to lead through it. Yeah. Yeah. It really was an acid test of leadership, I can say that. Um, in a related question, um, and from afar, someone has asked how the banking business in Northwest Ohio has been affected by COVID. So sort of on a macro level, um, what have been some impacts? Yeah, so that's, again, a great question and, and probably a topic for a four-hour seminar. I'll try to keep it brief, but, you know, all the things that every one of our clients dealt with, and again, I'm sure you dealt with the workplace, um, you know, planning, uh, cleaning, all the things that you talked about from the university. I mean, we in Northwest Ohio, we have, you know, roughly 50 financial centers. We had to go find hand sanitizer for all, all those things that we went through. You know, I, I guess I'll answer it a little bit differently. You know, we tried to focus on how to reach our clients differently. Said, hey, I'm not doing in-person meetings. I personally have had access to WebEx on my work system for over um, three and a half years. The first time I hosted a WebEx meeting was in late March of 2020. So I think just, again, leveraging the technology and clients needed to see us differently. You know, we were very fortunate. We, we maintained 99% um, of, our, of our financial centers up and running um, from a utilization perspective, which was effective, was in and of itself, but really leveraging the, the, the other channels that are available to reach our clients, whether it's commercial clients or retail-based clients. One of the things that we've seen through the pandemic is the adoption of our electronic transactions from a consumer banking perspective. So think about taking pictures of your checks, transferring money, um, frankly, um, applying for a mortgage loan electronically, a car loan electronically, all of those things. You know, we, we if you go back about six years, our electronic delivery, we were somewhere in the 20 to 25% adoption. That has slowly grown every year into the low 60 percentile range. Well, starting in March of last year, December, we actually saw that increase in the mid and upper 70 percentile. So 70 percent of the transactions that happen 
in a financial center on a daily, monthly, annual basis are now happening electronically. So the mm -hmm. speed at which we have adopted that and our clients have adopted that technology has certainly been enhanced you know, through COVID and the pandemic. And, and I would just expect that to continue. You can do things, I mean, frankly, I tell everybody on, on a regular basis, if I have a laptop and a cell phone access, I have an office. And that's just, that didn't happen five years ago. So it's really trying to work our way through that and reach our clients the way they want us to reach them. So great question from afar, thank you. Thank you. And so some students uh, and recent graduates asked questions of you and they said, looking back on your time as a student at Utilito, and it wasn't the Neff College of Business at that time, but it was probably the College of Business Administration possibly. Um, are there any classes, experiences, or pieces of advice from your time as a student that served you well in your career? Um, at the end answer to that is yes, uh, obviously all of them did, um, <laughs> but I, I'll pick I'll pick out a couple. So I, I loved, I cherished my University of Toledo experience. Um, you mentioned earlier the work that I do uh, college there. When I came to UT, I was, um, I was a very dedicated student. I wanted to, I was on a mission to get in, go to class. I didn't skip. I was, I'm very proud of this and I can't wait till my kids get to college. I can hold them accountable to this. I didn't skip one in-person class in my four years at UT. There aren't a lot of my friends that can say that. I took good notes. I woke up and I went to class because I was determined to get a good job when I graduated. But the ones that really, so when I started, I started as a finance major. I always knew I wanted a business degree. I, I sort of leaned towards finance. Um, I started as an information systems manager. I took a couple of computer classes. And again, you heard my WebEx history. I, I looked at that and said, I'm not sure this is what I really want to do as a backup if finance doesn't work. So I flipped to, I had a really cool economics professor, fell in love with my econ classes and said, I'm going to get an economics degree. Um, so I did that. I was on that path for about half a year. And then I just, by happenstance, took my first sales class and I absolutely loved it. And for me, I was more of an introvert than you might expect. Again, I wanted to get good grades and go get a job. That sales program really taught me um, that if I was going to be successful in you know, the, the business profession, I needed to step outside my shell and really focus a little more on how others perceive me and, and how I can relate to others. And, and so I started a journey there with the sales program that ended with, I was, frankly, um, I can't believe it's been over 20 years, but 20 years ago, I was one of the first classes from the university that could graduate with a sales minor. And then after that, I think a year or two after that, they added a sales major. So um, mm -hmm. the rest through my career inside the bank, the bank is obviously very consultative. We try to be value add to our clients. We really value many of the sales classes that I took at the University of Toledo over my 20 year career have been rolled out inside the bank. I actually was on a advisory team inside the bank to craft a consultative selling sales course for uh -huh. our commercial bankers because I had that experience at the University of Toledo. So every time the bank rolled out another sales program, I could say, yep, I've already done this. Not that I'm a professional, it's always good to get a refresher, but I'd been there, I'd experienced it. And for me, it was just a refresher versus starting from square one. So again, obviously all of my classes were important, but those sales classes for me and what I do every day really made a dramatic impact on my career over the years. Great question. Nothing like a ringing endorsement from a successful alumnus. Uh, for those of you who might not know, our sales program is nationally ranked and our students are extraordinarily competitive. And even in this pandemic, um, we we host ourselves um, a, a virtual competition. So that will be next month. So thank you very much for making note of that. Um, Another question from a student, and this would be the last one, is um, as someone who has successfully navigated the corporate ladder over your nearly 20 year career at Fifth Third, what advice do you have for students who are looking to successfully do the same? 
Yeah, another, man, these questions are great. So thank you to all the students for your engagement here. These are great questions. I, I underli I'll underline a word, or maybe highlight a word that was said there, and it was successfully. I mean, that is a relative term. Um, what, how I would answer that is, um, you know, there were plenty, it's been 20 years and that's, that's hard. I say that every time I give a presentation, it's hard for me to say I've been out in industry now for 20 years, actually 22, if you count my internships and I worked a year during my senior year, um, at the bank. So, um, successful is relative because there will be a hundred bumps along the way, um, all, you know, over that 20 year period, there are certainly things I can look back to and say, you know, I certainly considered leaving the bank or I, I call it quitting. Um, there are, quitting is always the easiest thing you can do. It's always easy to go start over, take a fresh look. And for me, I was really determined to um, overcome whatever obstacle I may have faced. So there are a lot of things I could say there, but being um, determined and persistent certainly were one. And it is unique. I get to ask that question a lot because in today's environment, you know, I think the, the the career average staying at a location or in a job is certainly getting smaller than when it or shorter than when it was when I started. But you know, to me, it was about being dedicated and determined to make a difference. I'm probably loyal by fault, both personally and professionally. So. I also say I was a little bit lucky. I had a really good boss in an organization that invested heavily in me. So I would relate that back to the question and say, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your family first. I don't think you can be successful in your organization or in your career if you're not, if you don't have a good quality home life and family life. At least for me, that's what's helped me do it. And be yourself. Find something that you do that motivates you and energizes you and every morning you wake up and you think, how can I be better at what I'm doing today? And if you're not asking those questions or challenging yourself, I think again, it's really easy to, to take a step backwards and say, maybe I should go find something else to do. And that doesn't mean that, you know, don't take those words the wrong way. That doesn't mean that sometimes you get to a point where you really need to make a career change or, or a shift either in your existing company and do something different or go find a new company. But I've always been fortunate. It seems like every three to five years, the bank, you know, either approached me or I approached them about, you know, wanting to do something different or to be challenged. And they've challenged me over that 20 years, every three to five years. And it always feels like I've had something different to focus on and do. So it, it's a, a really good question. I know it has a kind of a long winded, winded answer. The other thing I would say that helped me over my career, my, you know, one of my philosophies is always work hard and play harder. So work harder and, and smarter, but then also reward yourself and your family at the end of the day. Um, you know, we put these jackets on and these pins and we have to dress up and go to work. But at the end of the day, you have to go home to your family or, and yourself. And if you don't love what you do and, and really try to enjoy some of the small wins in your life, it'll be a really long, uh, a long year to say the least. So even last year, we found reason all the challenges that we face, we found reasons to celebrate again, both personally and professionally. So again, long winded answer, the successful word in that question is certainly relative, but you know, I appreciate the, the question and just know that you have to take care of yourself and your family first to have a really good, good and solid career. But, but again, a good question. Well, Alex, I have to tell you that was a fantastic response and, and Truer words were never spoken because obviously persistence is the key to um, a successful sales career and finding something you love um, and challenging yourself um, just and being genuine, which is something else you mentioned, is is really important. So I hope um, I hope those who are listening take that to heart and agree with you as well. I, I know you have a hard stop and we we do have um uh a couple more messages from other people on the call so i'm going to ask jordan to take it away and i thank you so much alex for your time for your dedication to your alma mater to you and great success to you in your career and in your um your uh leadership role we're so proud of you well thank you and i'd be if i didn't thank you uh for your involvement in the community it's it's uh it's certainly great when the community recognizes the importance of the university and the university recognizes the importance of the business community. So, so thank you 
uh, personally and professionally for what you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Jordan? And, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, Alex, we just have uh, one, one last question before you leave um, from the audience. Um, it says, do you believe there are any correlation between socially responsible public companies and higher, lower dividends? Oh, man. Um, tying it directly to dividends is a tough one because that's, you know, that's a that's a, a policy. Frankly, Mark may be able to answer that one. I'll, but I will answer the, the socially the social aspect of that and maybe tie it to financial performance. Um, I think as, if you've noticed any of the announcements, if you haven't, go Google Fifth Third Bank and, and some of the social things that we're doing and environmental things that we're doing. Um, we were one of the first financial institutions to um, make an environmentally friendly policy. We just recently an, uh, made an additional announcement on that. I'll let you go Google it to save time. Um, but what, the reason we've done that is strategically, we do believe that in the future, financial performance will directly be tied to uh, some of those policies, mostly because consumer behaviors continue to change. So as it becomes more and more uh, in the out in the future or out, excuse me, out in the public and talked about more regularly, we've recognized the importance that it has on our customers. The, the bank has, and again, made some environmental announcements here, not that too uh, far back. So go Google that. And I, so I do believe that, again, take the dividends question, part of that question to the side. I do think it will drive financial performance in the future, which again is why strategically the bank has done that. Another really good question. Yeah, very good. Um, and again, that's definitely a, a tough, a tough one. But uh, thank you so much for um, giving us your insights, your experience, and advice for all the all the students watching and, and anybody that is, um, you know, just love to have your inputs on all these different topics. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, transition because I know you have a hard stop here coming up. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We're gonna transition to um, Aaron Hafner. Um, Aaron Hefner is the Assistant Director of Annual Giving, um, and she's going to provide additional information about how attendees who would like to help Kobe uh, financially uh, can do so, as well as information on future giving opportunities. Um, so we're going to go ahead and uh, turn over to you, Aaron. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. I um, want to make sure I'm not muted anymore. Fabulous. Okay, it's always so great to hear all of the wonderful things that are coming out of the college. I want to let you all know about this year's date for the annual day of giving. Typically, it's held in October. However, this year, it will be held April 7th and 8th. We have chosen, Dean Bayless has chosen, three great funds to give to. They are listed on your screen. She has chosen the Kobai Progress Fund with the intent that any funds raised will be used for faculty research. This will allow all of the faculty to stay on the cutting edge of trends that are um, you know, within the ever-changing world of business. It will allow the faculty to stay up to date on everything. So your gift to the college, it shows your support and your confidence in the work that Dean Bayless and her team are doing. There is a link that is listed on your screen. So if you'd like to make a gift today, you can do so. Thank you so much and go Rockets. Jordan? All righty. Well, um, that's all we have for today. Uh, thanks, everybody, for kicking off your weekend with us. Um, again, just want to thank our guest speaker, Alex Gerken, and Professor Mark Simpson for taking time out of their busy schedule to share their knowledge, research, and insights with us today. Uh, lastly, we'd like to thank our host, wonderful host, Dean and Bayless, uh, not just for events like this today, but for the leadership that you provide to the Utilito Neff College of Business and Innovation. Uh, thanks for audience, all of you as well, for staying in touch uh, with the John and Lillian Neff College of Business and Innovation. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. Take care.